Good afternoon. I'm so glad to be with you. I'm Reverend Carrie Jackson of Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. And I am so excited about the two amazing people we have with us today. I will introduce one who will introduce our featured speaker. But first, before I share with you who we have as our moderator today, I wanna let you know that Abortion Wars, this webinar is the first in our winter series of webinars. January 26th, we will have another one in which we will be looking at racist benevolence, reproductive control of indigenous women. And then the very next week, also on a Tuesday on February 2nd, we will explore the issue of the adoption industry here in the US. Please don't miss either of those. They're gonna be absolutely marvelous. But to kick off for today, I am so honored to introduce to you Gil Frank, who is the wonderful secretary of the RCRC board. And Gil is the person who connected us with our featured speaker today, Mary Ziegler. In addition to being on the RCRC board, um, his full-time work is as a postdoctoral fellow at University of Virginia. Gill received his PhD from the Department of American Studies at Brown University. He has intertwined wonderfully the histories of religion, sexuality, and gender in the U.S. He is working on what I know is going to be an amazing book. I can't wait for it, Gill. And that is Making Choice Sacred, Liberal Religion and Reproductive Rights Before Roe v. v. Wade. And last thing I'll tell you about Gil, because there's so much to say, but please check in with Gil's podcast, Sexing History. Yes, you heard me say it, Sexing History. Gil has a wonderful podcast about the history of sexuality and how it shapes the U.S. Gil, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Reverend Jackson, for that warm and wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. It is my absolute privilege to be here with you all today at this wonderful event being hosted by the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. Before I introduce our future, our featured speaker, I should say, I want to invite you to visit our website at rcrc.org. That's rcrc.org. And to sign up for our newsletter, that way we can keep you up to date on our numerous educational and activist initiatives. And as Reverend Jackson just mentioned, we have numerous talks and symposia planned for this year to help us map the histories and politics of faith and reproductive justice. So again, if you visit rcrc.org, go to the very bottom right of the screen and sign up for our updates. And we also invite you to share these with your friends and colleagues. So for this webinar, I also wanna invite you to ask questions in the Q&A window. We'll have time at the end for these. You can also upvote the questions you like to make sure that we see them. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Mary Ziegler. Professor Ziegler is the Stearns Weaver Miller Professor at Florida State University College of Law. She teaches and writes on the legal history of reproduction and constitutional law, family law, and sexuality. Now, Professor Ziegler's scholarship has been path setting and plentiful. The through line of her work, which includes numerous books and articles, is to show how the popular stories we tell about abortion law and social struggles often obscure more than they reveal. Her books and articles on the history and politics of abortion in the United States offer an incisive understanding for the rethinking of the relationships between law, religion, and politics, and how all three have changed together over time. I first became aware of Professor Ziegler's book in her magnificent, uh, her first book, her After Roe, The Lost History of the Abortion Debate, which came out from Harvard in 2015. And this book studies the ways in which grassroots activists and politicians responded to the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling in the two decades that follow it. This book is magnificent. It uses rich archival sources, oral histories, and each chapter showcases the political complexity and internal struggles of the pro-choice 
and anti-abortion movements and how these movements changed over time while reshaping the meaning of both Roe and reproductive rights. Professor Ziegler's most recent book is Abortion and the Law in America, Roe v. Wade to the Present, and this came out last year. I taught with it this past semester, and it is amazing. It likewise challenges what we think we know about abortion law and its relationships to social activism through a series of compelling case studies. And this book argues that the terms of the American abortion struggle have changed in key debates, such as over the costs and benefits of abortion, the relationship of abortion and healthcare to the role of government, our responsibility to the, our responsibility to the poor, personal autonomy, informed consent, and so much more. So on behalf of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, welcome Professor Ziegler. I'm so glad you can join us and that we can learn from you today about the abortion wars after Rao. Well, thanks. Uh, and so I should, I wish Gil's book was out now because we all really badly needed it in the conversations about faith and reproductive justice that have been unfolding surrounding today's Senate race in Georgia. Um, so I'm going to focus today, I think, largely on anti the abortion strategy. And my reasons for doing that in the history is that I think often people who work in reproductive justice don't study this history, right? I think it's natural to study the history um, of, hero, of the people we view as heroes. Uh, and the reasons I think for this are several, but uh, per perhaps the most immediate is that the Supreme Court seems poised to roll back abortion rights and in fact has been behaving uh, strangely recently involving a Mississippi case that and a law that would ban abortion at 15 weeks gestation. So it may be that in the coming weeks, we hear that the Supreme Court will take this case and quite likely given that the court has a conservative supermajority, do something to change what abortion rights in America look like. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we got to the present moment um, in terms of the strategies the anti-abortion movement is using, how those strategies came about, whether and how they're effective, um, which I think, of course, will involve a story about the reproductive justice movement, too, and some of the potential mistakes that it made. So um, again, some of this story is in my book. So if this is something that you're interested in in greater depth, I'd encourage you to take a look. Um, and it's not as expensive as history books sometimes are. So of course, Roe v. Wade um, came down in 1973. Uh, Roe recognized a right to choose abortion, held that the right to privacy recognized in the constitution was broad enough to encompass abortion decisions. Uh, and Roe, of course, as most historians recognize, did not give rise to the anti-abortion movement. The anti-abortion movement existed pre-Roe. Um, the narrative that Roe created the anti-abortion movement came along later um, in part as an effort to justify the overruling of Roe. So in the immediate aftermath of Roe, uh, the anti-abortion movement was trying to do what really the anti-abortion movement has always sought to do, and that was to institute a nationwide abortion ban. The movement's reasoning was that there was a right to life um, recognized in the Declaration of Independence and the 14th Amendment. Uh, the movement's references to everything from efforts to abolish slavery, to the civil rights movement of the 1950s were no accident. The movement also wanted to use the same constitutional tools to criminalize abortion, not just in red states or conservative states, but also in progressive states. So uh, we have pictured here, this is Senator James Buckley, who is the brother of William F. Buckley, one of the sponsors of a constitutional ban on abortion that was circulating in Congress in the 1970s. Um, but as many of you know, who were familiar with uh, the campaign for the Equal Rights Amendment, it's very, very hard to pass a constitutional amendment. Um, it's, it's sort of a running joke among law professors that amending the US Constitution is more or less a non-starter for social movements. Um, and that would especially have been true with something like an outright abortion ban, which then as now was not supported by a majority of Americans. So that didn't deter abortion opponents um, for some time, but leading anti-abortion groups, which were becoming more strategically sophisticated in this period, recognized that an, a constitutional abortion ban at a minimum was going to take a little while and that they didn't have the votes in Congress to pass what they called the Human Life Amendment. So instead, they began searching for a way to keep the abortion rate down in the meantime, 
Uh, and they sought out what they would later call um, incremental strategies. So laws that would reduce the abortion rate um, and potentially set the stage for a decision um, that would make Roe v. Wade look less coherent. So they reasoned that if there was a right to abortion, but no one could actually access abortion, or if there was a right to privacy, but other people could weigh in on the reasons you made a decision or the methods you used in exercising that decision, that a right to choose would seem incoherent and not worth defending. Uh, so initially, the, they would the anti-abortion movement proposed laws like the Hyde Amendment, which we'll talk about at more length, include both state and federal bans like the Hyde Amendment, limiting Medicaid reimbursement for abortion, laws mandating family involvement, whether that it meant husbands or parents, um, and so-called informed consent laws that uh, often required patients to hear information that most doctors deem to either be irrelevant, um, not medical, or in some instances, inaccurate. The Hyde Amendment, um, this is Henry Hyde here, this is a fairly accurate picture of Henry Hyde, both in the sense of that this was what he was look, looked like, and also in the sense that he was pretty much always on the phone. Um, Henry Hyde's eponymous amendment uh, gave rise to, um, I think, really, unintentionally a blueprint for what the anti-abortion movement would do in the decades to come. So as you recall, this strategy began as a sort of stopgap measure, uh, what the anti-abortion movement would do while the fight for a constitutional amendment unfolded. Um, and Hyde's bill became a kind of model for that strategy. Uh, the Hyde Amendment had um, in theory, from the outset allowed for certain exceptions. So these exceptions varied from year to year because the Hyde Amendment is an appropriations bill and Congress has to reintroduce it annually. But they often involve things like rape or incest or health threats. But what anti-abortion opponents realized quite quickly was that the Hyde Amendment effectively eliminated all abortions. So uh, not entirely, but more or less, the abortion rate dropped precipitously when women and pregnant people had to justify themselves to bureaucrats who introduced more and more hurdles for low-income women seeking reimbursement for abortion. And so in part, the Hyde Amendment showed that what looked like incremental restrictions could function like outright bans. As important, the Hyde Amendment became a blueprint for what would happen if a constitutional amendment wouldn't work. That is to say that instead of seeking to ban abortion outright, the movement could seek to hollow Roe v. Wade out to such a degree that the Supreme Court might either rethink it or that there would really be nothing left for the Supreme Court to preserve. So the effort to think of a plan B um, beyond a constitutional amendment really came to a head in the early 1980s. So the anti-abortion movement in the 1980s was really delighted and pleased by the, the electoral results. So Dr. John Wilkie, who was the head of the National Right to Life Committee, called the 1980 election fantasy island come true, right, in, in a reference to the television show that was then on at the time. And anti-abortion leaders um, took charge of both houses of Congress um, on the heels of really kind of record political action or committee or PAC spending by the new right. But even then the anti-abortion movement lacked the votes for the kind of outright ban that the movement wanted. And the fight about what the second best alternative would be ultimately doomed any constitutional amendment proposal really until the present day. So the alternatives were proposed um, one, by, this is, uh, as many of you recognize, Jesse Helms, the famous Senator No, who was known um, largely for being a segregationist, but was also a strong abortion opponent. Um, Helms' strategy was to have a statute banning abortion outright. And that had the advantage of essentially criminalizing all abortions nationwide. The problem was, for anti-abortion pragmatists, this was probably unconstitutional. So the Supreme Court has said that Congress can't contradict the Supreme Court's interpretation of constitutional rights, even if it can enforce the rights the court has recognized. But of course, Roe v. Wade, among other things, had recognized that fetal personhood for, for constitutional purposes begins after birth, not before, um, a conclusion that Helms directly refuted in his bill. 
Pragmatists were attracted to the strategy introduced by uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, who's depicted here on the right, this is a young Senator Hatch, who wanted to introduce a constitutional amendment that would essentially remove Roe v. Wade and let the states decide for themselves whether or not to criminalize abortion. And these proposals actually touched off a civil war in the anti-abortion movement. Helms proponents thought that Hatch proponents were um, essentially rhinos, right? They were kind of cowardly, compromising moderates who were selling the anti-abortion movement out. Hatch proponents thought that Helms champions were irrational absolutists who simply wanted to make themselves feel better instead of accomplishing anything. And the end result was that neither proposal passed and the anti-abortion movement functionally gave up on a, a national constitutional ban, um, more or less until today. So the question then became, well, what was the anti-abortion movement going to do? The anti-abortion movement's entire existence really from 1973 on had been justified by a, the quest for a constitutional amendment. Um, the same was true of the anti-abortion movement's reliance on the GOP. Uh, prior to the early 1980s, and the evolution was gradual, um, really going all the way back to Richard Nixon, but there wasn't a clear party alignment around abortion until the 1980s. Um, and to some degree, both party leaders at various points avoided taking very strong stands on abortion. Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford are great examples. That changed in 1980 in part because of Ronald Reagan, who had kind of in a way stood out even in 1976 for being a strong opponent of abortion. But the anti-abortion movement had kind of put all of its eggs in the GOP basket in 1980. And many in the anti-abortion movement asked what there was to show for that, because the reason for aligning with the GOP had been to get the right people in Congress to vote through a constitutional amendment banning abortion. But there was no real prospect of a constitutional abor abortion ban anytime soon. So the Hyde Amendment, again, became a kind of saving grace for a movement that was looking for a new justification to rally recruits um, and to justify itself to donors. And the new solution was that the GOP would become the path to controlling the Supreme Court and to putting justices on the court who would be willing to overturn Roe. And the new goal became not a national amendment banning abortion, but a, a decision overturning Roe. And potentially down the road, a subsequent Supreme Court decision recognizing a right to life, which would have the same effect as a ban on abortion written into the Constitution. So, this plan really gained momentum um, after 1983 when Sandra Day O'Connor, who's pictured here, um, fueled anti-abortion interest in this strategy. So this strategy all turned around what was kind of a model law at the time, very similar to what you see now where states would copy one another's abortion restrictions. This got underway in the 70s and this model ordinance actually passed in Akron, Ohio, which as we all know is the, the epicenter of the world, second only to Butte, Montana, where I grew up as the epicenter of the universe. Uh, and Akron's ordinance was a kind of prototypical uh, anti-abortion multi-restriction law. It had a parental involvement piece, it restricted which procedures providers could perform. Uh, it, it required providers to recite information that was inaccurate about things like abortion causing infertility or post-traumatic stress. Uh, and when the law arrived at the Supreme Court, it was the first crack that Sandra Day O'Connor would get at abortion jurisprudence. Now, abortion opponents had very little faith in O'Connor, who as a state lawmaker um, in Arizona was reputed to be pro-choice. And in fact, abortion opponents had protested Reagan's decision to nominate her and viewed it as a pretty profound betrayal of their cause. But when O'Connor had the chance, she voted in dissent that she would have upheld Akron's law, suggested that Roe in general, particularly the idea of disallowing states to ban abortion before viability, that that was implausible and untenable. And she proposed a less protective standard that she called the undue burden test, which would allow abortion restrictions so long as they didn't create what she called a severe or absolute obstacle. As you can imagine, very few restrictions create a severe or absolute obstacle short of an outright ban early in gestation. Uh, 
So when O'Connor wrote this dissent, abortion opponents in groups like the National Right to Life Committee and Americans United for Life saw that they had potentially a winning strategy, that changing the court could make a difference. The tricky thing, of course, was that laws like Akron's or the Hyde Amendment for that matter, required different arguments. So talking about a right to life for unborn children or for fetuses didn't really explain why you could have an abortion but not get it funded or have an abortion but have to hear information about infertility or have an abortion but have to consult your parents. So to justify all of these laws, leading anti-abortion groups, instead of talking about the right to choose or the right to life, began to talk about what abortion in America was really like and to argue that abortion should be restricted, not just because of fetal rights, but also because there were harms that abortion worked on families, on pregnant people, um, and on communities. And that argument and strategies built around it are very much still unfolding today in state legislatures and in the Supreme Court. So I'll try to trace a little bit about how we get from Akron to Amy Coney Barrett and the Mississippi case that the court may be taking up soon. So some of the arguments that you see unsurprisingly became caught up very quickly with race and gender. So anti-abortion groups began seizing on the idea that abortion access was destroying the traditional nuclear family. Uh, the argument being that abortion would damage teenagers' relationship with their parents, or at least abortion access would, that women, and particularly uh, women and pregnant people of color, um, had abortions for trivial reasons. Uh, they looped these arguments into claims about uh, pregnant drug use um, and efforts to prosecute pregnant people for child abuse based on their behavior during pregnancy. Uh, and this forced, I think, people who are in favor of abortion access to think and talk differently about abortion too. So instead of talking in abstractions about things like autonomy or equality, people who were um, in favor of keeping Roe had to respond with their own accounts of what abortion was really like and what the effects of abortion access were like. This was true not only in politics where you saw groups like NARAL um, making arguments of that kind. It was also true in court. So you began to see groups like the National Women's Law Center arguing that abortion access was an important matter of equality, not just in the abstract, not just because anti-abortion lawmakers may have harbored stereotypes about gender roles, but because abortion access had made a concrete difference to people who were, for example, seeking to continue educations or pursue a career. Um, and so the argument was in part that abortion rights mattered because of their practical real world consequences for pregnant people. Um, these arguments fact figured centrally in the effort to minimize laws mandating parental involvement for minors. And they ended up in part for that reason um, as being central to the effort to preserve Roe v. Wade itself. Now at the time, pretty much everybody assumed that the Supreme Court would overrule Roe because then as now, there was a super majority of conservatives placed there by President George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan. Um, then as now, the justices had been put there with the expectation that they would overturn Roe. And so the plan at the time was to lose as spectacularly as possible to mobilize as many voters who were supportive of reproductive justice as possible and therefore take control of the White House and the Congress and pass some kind of federal law protecting reproductive justice. Um, in fact, what the Supreme Court did was to sort of make everyone angry, both anti-abortion and reproductive justice folks by doing something that was sort of in between. So the court declined an invitation to overturn Roe, but introduced a rule of law that makes the reality of abortion in America even more central to constitutional jurisprudence. And that was called the undue burden standard. So the undue burden standard was not the same one Sandra Day O'Connor had mentioned. It was a little different. It asked whether a law had the purpose or effect of creating an obstacle for people seeking abortion. That of course required lawyers and politicians to a lesser extent to talk and think about the effects of abortion restrictions and whether abortion restrictions as anti-abortion activists would later argue were beneficial rather than damaging. The court also took up pretty seriously the argument that abortion access had helped 
pregnant people and particularly women achieve equal citizenship in the United States. The court did this in the context of talking about reliance interests. So often when a court is evaluating whether to overturn an established precedent like Roe, the court will ask whether people have relied on it in ordering their lives. Now, usually that means something like a business arrangement or a contract where people have to know the rules well in advance to make their financial affairs orderly. That didn't seem appropriate to conservatives at the time when it came to abortion, because some, perhaps many pregnant people didn't plan to get pregnant at all, much less in advance. But the court defined reliance in a different way, essentially drawing on these ideas about the effects of abortion access for women nationwide saying that the availability of abortion had allowed women and pregnant people to pursue opportunities that wouldn't otherwise have been available to them. So Casey um, did lots of things, right? It overturned part of Roe. So when you think of Casey now, um, or Roe now, it's not there in the way it once was. Um, it preserved viability as the line you could ban abortion, um, but it left lots of open questions, like what exactly an undue burden is, which experts still can't really answer today. Um, was it closer to something like strict scrutiny, which means that virtually any abortion restriction would be unconstitutional? Or was it something that would let legislators pretty much do what they wanted, which would be what lawyers would call a rational basis test? Casey also made it crucial, as the anti-abortion side saw it, to dig into this argument that pregnant people relied on abortion and that women had relied on abortion to achieve um, equality in America. So the anti-abortion movement had already been thinking a lot about arguing that abortion was bad for communities and families. But after Casey, there became a significant emphasis on arguments that abortion was bad for women too. So groups like the Americans United for Life recognized that the court had built the foundation of abortion rights post Casey on the idea that abortion access benefited women. Um, and so, Americans United for Life attorneys argued, as did their allies in um, the conservative evangelical movement and other anti-abortion groups, that if the movement could in fact prove that abortion access hurt women or made them sick, then the justification for saving abortion rights would go away. So at this point, anti-abortion groups began tapping into existing organizations like Women Exploited for by Abortion, pictured here, uh, the American Victims of Abortion, a group that the National Right to Life Committee helped to found, and others, essentially gathering evidence that, in fact, abortion was dangerous um, or was psychologically and physically crippling for people um, who pursued it. Now, this, of course, made it even harder for anyone to seek common ground on solutions for pregnant people, because as the anti-abortion movement um, began introducing these strategies, the anti-abortion movement also began looking for new sources of evidence to support the laws it wanted to pass. So when groups like the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists refuted arguments that anti-abortion lawmakers wanted to make, anti-abortion leaders responded essentially that medical authorities were biased, were politically pro-choice, and would disregard evidence that contradicted their political preferences. The anti-abortion movement also tried to write its views about the harms done by abortion to women into law. This often, it, at first, looked like more robust or more controversial informed consent laws, several of which we've seen even in recent years. So instead of talking about what will largely look sort of like irrelevant information, like the availability of adoption agencies or child support, the new generation of laws took up contested claims about everything from the idea that abortion increased the risk of breast cancer, which was a claim rejected by the National Cancer Institutes and the American Cancer Society, um, the idea that abortion caused post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, recently, uh, the argument that pill-based abortions or medication abortions can be reversed um, if a patient takes large doses of progesterone. Um, all of these laws were designed both to limit access to abortion and discourage patients from getting abortion, but also to tee up a subsequent challenge to Roe and Casey, one that would argue that um, there was no conflict of interest between pregnant people and fetuses that in fact 
Roe and abortion access hurt everyone equally and that the Supreme Court would not be doing any damage to anyone by un overturning both decisions. As part of this strategy, uh, anti-abortion groups created their own kind of parallel medical institutions and evidence gathering capacities. Uh, so over here, we have David Reardon's book, Aborted Women Silent No More. Reardon would gather the testimonies of women who had regretted abortions with an eye to showing that abortion was damaging. Um, over here, we have Dr. Joel Brind, who was or is actually um, an endocrinologist at uh, Baruch College. Um, Mr. Brind was one of those who advanced most prominently theses about abortion and breast cancer, the so-called ABC connection. And this made abortion opponents more and more convinced that anyone who disagreed with them was either dishonest or was being manipulated or um, deluded about the reality of how abortion in America worked. This soon became a part of constitutional law too during the debate about so-called partial birth abortion or dilation and extraction. So here we have George W. Bush signing into law a federal ban on partial birth abortion. And this is a depiction of partial birth abortion that was circulated at the time uh, by anti-abortion activists. Uh, the ban on partial birth abortion at first seems to really have not much to do with these disputes about science and public health and reality at all. Um, it seemed to be mostly about kind of highly detailed descriptions of an abortion procedure that was designed to make people uncomfortable and opposed to abortion writ large. But quickly what happened was that abortion rights supporters argued that there had to be a health exception to this ban on a specific procedure. And abortion opponents responded that the procedure itself was never beneficial to patients and in fact was dangerous. And that, that dispute eventually reached the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in a case called Gonzalez versus Carhartt helped lay out yet another roadmap that we see abortion opponents pursuing today. Gonzalez essentially said two things that were pretty crucial. First, Gonzalez said, that the state had an interest in protecting women from their own bad decisions about abortion, essentially preventing post-abortion regret. And that in service of this interest, the uh, Congress could essentially ban specific procedures outright. Perhaps even more significantly, the court in Gonzalez said that uh, in event, the event of scientific uncertainty, lawmakers should have more latitude to operate. Now the court didn't say what created scientific uncertainty or what rose to the level of scientific uncertainty, but the majority in Gonzalez did say that there was scientific uncertainty in that case. So the fact that there had been some anti-abortion doctors and some anti-abortion experts, and at various points, even the American Medical Association, that was enough to create doubt. And that in that climate of doubt, Congress should have the ability to criminalize this procedure without a health exception. So after Gonzalez and really even now, the anti-abortion movement has been leveraging scientific uncertainty to introduce new regulations. Um, so for example, you see bans on dilation and evacuation, which is the most common procedure after the first trimester. These, um, this is of, often something that would force patients to choose less proven, less safe methods or to undergo additional procedures. But abortion opponents justify them using this idea of scientific uncertainty, saying that it's not crystal clear that um, these additional procedures are unsafe or that other alternatives aren't okay. Um, and also using as a logical extension, saying if Gonzalez says specific procedures can be banned later in pregnancy, we're just taking that to the next logical step and banning this other procedure. Abortion opponents have also done the same thing in introducing specific gestational bans. So that began with 20 week bans on the theory that fetal pain was possible at 20 weeks, a proposition that's rejected by most medical authorities, but accepted by a handful of them, again, enough to potentially introduce scientific uncertainty. Those weeks, those bans of course have been moved up. Mississippi's law that the Supreme Court is considering hearing bans abortion at 15 weeks on the theory that fetal pain is possible then, which is a conclusion rejected by even more medical authorities, but yet is still one that um, you can find an expert or two to go along with. Um, all of these things were designed to build on Gonzalez, but also crucially to get rid of the idea that you could only ban abortion after viability. 
again, the idea being that the less Roman, the less it protected, the easier it would be to go back to the Supreme Court later and argue that abortion jurisprudence was incoherent and that for all intents and purposes, abortion rights were already gone. Uh, in this era, you didn't though see the kinds of absolute bans that you see today. And the reasons for that, I think are fairly straightforward. So after 2010, you had the Tea Party wave of 2010. Um, courtesy of lots and lots of outside spending produced by Citizens United. You have some Tea Party protesters over here. Um, you had a kind of shift to the right in terms of what anti-abortion activists were willing to talk about publicly in terms of things like religious liberty and contraception. So here we have some people who are protesting the contraceptive mandate of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and all of that meant more abortion restrictions um, and also, uh, I think more of a sense that change of a more major kind in terms of an attack on Roe would be possible. That didn't seem to be true in 2016. This is uh, uh, some folks outside of the Supreme Court before this case, Holman's Health versus Hellerstead. The court struck down uh, two Texas laws, one requiring requiring abortion clinics to comply with ambulatory surgical center regulations and another requiring providers to have admitting privileges within 30 miles at a hospital within 30 miles. Um, Holman's Health also made the undue burden test mean more. So it wasn't clear if it really protected abortion rights a lot, a little, or somewhere in between. Holman's Health essentially said, if you pass an abortion restriction, um, courts will consider both the benefits and the burdens of the restriction. Why that mattered was that if a law was pointless, right, if it was a solution in search of a problem, that law may be unconstitutional, even if the burdens created on access to abortion were somewhat minimal. The court in Holman's Health also said that the kind of deference in terms of scientific uncertainty that Gonzalez had put in place was, would be less absolute than the court had previously suggested. But, after Holman's health, of course, this reality didn't last for long. Um, Anthony Kennedy, who had long been the swing justice on abortion, retired. Um, Donald Trump replaced him with Brett Kavanaugh. And states responded with a wave of absolute or fairly absolute bans on abortion, all of which were designed to, as Alabama lawmakers put it, force the Supreme Court to reconsider Roe v. Wade. Um, the most prominent of these, at least in 2019, were laws banning abortion at six weeks gestation when a fetal heartbeat could be detected. And these two were predicated on arguments about scientific uncertainty in the reality of abortion. There were disputes at the time and now about whether fetal heartbeats are even a thing at six weeks or whether that's cardiac activity. Um, but all, all of the laws were designed to focus not just on fetal rights arguments, but arguments that abortion was bad for America and that Roe v. Wade had been bad for American politics in terms of creating polarization, politicizing the Supreme Court, and kind of hopelessly dividing Americans on a variety of issues. We don't know much about exactly how this strategy will unfold at the Supreme Court. The, the last real data point we have was this summer's decision in June Medical Services versus Russo. Uh, June Medical involved a law identical to the one that the Supreme Court had just struck down in 2016, a law that required doctors to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital. Louisiana, the state that had passed the law, insisted that its situation on the ground was different from the one in Texas that it wouldn't burden patients as much. And more to the point, Louisiana said, doctors in Louisiana haven't really tried that hard to get abortion privileges. Louisiana also tried to argue that abortion providers themselves should never be able to challenge abortion protections at all. Because abortion, it was like the fox guarding the hen house. Abortion providers were actually um, looking to profit at the expense of patients while patients wanted to receive safe care. Now, all of these arguments would have been consequential in themselves because states would have rushed to copy this legislation. And if abortion providers couldn't sue, it would have been much, much harder for anyone to bring constitutional challenges to abortion regulations. But again, they were all so designed to tee up an eventual overruling of Roe because both arguments would credit the idea that abortion is dangerous um, and not just bad for the nation as a whole, but for the very patients that seek it out. The Supreme Court 
um, wound up striking down Louisiana's law in what kind of looked like empiric victory. It was actually kind of funny. I remember the day it came down because most reporters acted as if this was this big kind of coming out party for the progressive John Roberts. It, it didn't look like that for long. So the justices struck down Louisiana's law, but Roberts, whose, law, whose opinion seems to be the law of the case wrote separately, he changed what the undue burden test meant and made it a lot less protective for abortion rights, restored the idea of deference to scientific uncertainty that had been in place before, um, and seemingly made it easier for states to introduce abortion restrictions, which is what most lower courts have concluded since. So for a time, it seemed as if Roberts would be the new swing justice, and that these debates about the reality of abortion in America would have to be tailored to him. But then, of course, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away um, tragically and was replaced by Amy Coney Barrett. So now, once again, we have a conservative supermajority at the Supreme Court. Now, at first blush, that might make it seem as if we're going to have a pretty robust return to arguments about rights. And I think on some level, that's probably true because fundamentally, uh, the anti abortion movement has never stopped believing that there is a right to life and never really stopped prioritizing that internally. What instead has changed is the way it talks about abortion publicly and the kinds of strategies it uses to unravel abortion rights. At the same time, though, I think it, it's a mistake to assume that the Supreme Court will quickly recognize a right to life or even the demise of a right to choose. So arguments about what abortion in America is like will be crucial in the short term. And they may be crucial in the long term too, because as you recall, the fight about whether Roe should stay or go and whether abortion should be legal or criminal in the United States have remained arguments about what abortion is like, what people who seek out abortions are like, whether abortion has poisoned our politics or whether our politics have been poisoned by something else. And so I expect to see all of those debates play out in the Supreme Court and in the political arena um, in the days and weeks ahead. Um, and I'm happy in Q&A to talk about you know, where we might be going in broader terms too, but I'll stop there so that we have time to talk. Thank you, Professor Ziegler, so much for that talk. If I could ask you to unshare your screen so we can both be on together. Um, and I just wanna welcome our participants, our audience, to type their questions into the Q&A window. We already have a couple and we will take a few of them while we have some time. Um, I actually wanted to uh, turn to the question of one of our, um, our audience members and that is from William Harmon. And uh, William asks, can the new emphasis on religious liberty be used to counter anti-abortion laws? For example, he writes, if a woman is following her religious beliefs about abortion, when she chooses an abortion, do laws preventing her violate her religious liberty? And he adds, there are faith communities who affirm a woman's, a woman's God-given right to terminate a pregnancy. Yeah, it's a complicated question. So um, the Supreme Court, this conservative Supreme Court seems poised to expand dramatically what religious liberty entails. There's a major case before the court, uh, actually this term that we expect a decision in that will likely make it much easier to bring a constitutional challenge based on religious liberty. It's difficult to say whether that will extend to women um, accessing abortion. The court had an opportunity to take a case dealing with just that issue and declined to. Um, and so one might worry that the court won't view all religious liberty claims fairly or equally. Uh, we just don't know at this point. I think it could help, but the court has been more solicitous of the religious liberty of some faith communities than others. And so that might raise concerns. The other challenge I think is that in the past when um, the court has dealt with religious liberty claims for abortion rights, even all the way back to the 1980s, uh, those claims were not successful. So there has been a kind of shift away from those arguments. But I, I think, as Mr. Herman points out, that's changing now, right? So I think that we have to stay tuned. And if there's any cause for concern, it would be that the court is more sympathetic to the religious liberty of Christian conservatives than it would be to others. Thank you. Thank you for that. One of the questions I want to ask you is, where do the recent fetal burial provisions that we've seen crop up in Ohio and so many other places fit into the story that you're telling us? 
So uh, fetal demise laws are, um, or fetal remains laws like the one we saw in Ohio are part of a much broader strategy to make Rose conclusions and Casey's conclusions about personhood an outlier, right? So um, Roe has said, Roe said, we're gonna view personhood as a matter of what the text of the constitution says. And when the framers of the constitution use the word person, pretty much all the time they were referring to after birth. So there's been a strategy really in place since the 1980s to make that look like a weird conclusion when you compare it to the rest of the law. So the law on everything from um, homicide, right? So if a, a pregnant person is killed, um, is that a murder of one person or two people? Um, when you bring personal injury lawsuits and somebody dies in utero, all of that. So the idea was that if personhood begins at fertilization, in lots of other domains, or if we treat fetal remains as persons under the law, then it begins to look more and more incongruous that Roe v. Wade does not recognize fetal personhood at fertilization. So those laws are part of that um, part of that strategy, uh, and I think they're also sort of relate, similar to informed consent laws in the sense that they're designed to um, coach people to think of fetal remains as persons too on a kind of micro level, in addition to sending that message legislatively and then potentially in a way that could be used in a subsequent challenge to Roe. Thank you for that. Um, Cheryl Anderson asks, have there been strategies to address the undue burden abortion restrictions caused to persons of color? Yes, more recently, yes. So one of the sort of depressing things about writing this history um, from a legal standpoint has been that historically there has been, I think, on the reproductive right side, a kind of dismaying willingness to de-emphasize the needs of people of color. Um, until it, it tells you a lot that until recently the Hyde Amendment had bipartisan support. Um, I think that was because everyone believed that access for low-income people of color was a kind of fundraising loser and a political loser. So there have been more efforts lately. So there's a, a case involving Georgia's heartbeat ban now called Sister Song versus Kemp that spotlights the fact that a six week abortion ban would of course affect everybody but would have disproportionate and more serious effects on pregnant people of color. So I think in more recent years, the reproductive justice movement has had um, more of an impact, as you all well know, not only on faith communities, not only on activist communities, but also on constitutional litigation and the way that it's framed. So, but I think that's a more recent phenomenon. So it'll be interesting to see if the Supreme Court, um, you know, cares about that. I would be skeptical of that because our only real insight from the Supreme Court into questions of, of race and abortion has been Clarence Thomas's uh, 2019 opinion suggesting that um, the eugenics movement kind of gave rise to Planned Parenthood, which in turn is influencing individual people's decision to have an abortion. So that's that's the only kind of word we've heard about abortion and race and from the Supreme Court, which is not really, you know, filling one with lots of optimism about a nuanced take on race going forward. But uh, it's also true that there hasn't been as much emphasis put by reproductive rights litigators on how people of color are affected by these laws. So it, it may make a difference if, um, if more decision makers like those on the court see those arguments. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Jennifer Holland asks, are there particular legal innovators of these strategies in the 21st century? Are they linked up with broader conservative legal movements? Um, so yes, right? I mean, to some degree, yes. So yes and no, right? So the anti-abortion movements really struggled to gain a foothold as a kind of legitimate legal actor for a long time, right? So the Federalist Society, which is the sort of elite legal conservative movement, wouldn't touch the abortion issue with a 10-foot pole until after Robert Bork embraced it, after his failed confirmation hearings. Um, and ALEC, um, which is, as many of you know, the kind of leading um, machine for pumping out conservative legislation, has largely stayed away from social issues too, because many of its corporate donors don't really want to go there. So um, the anti-abortion, a lot of the leading strategists in the anti-abortion movement are um, anti-abortion activists first um, and have to some degree remained prom prominent primarily in their own communities. That's changed some as the movement became more deeply embedded in the GOP, I think particularly during the Trump administration, um, as other researchers have demonstrated, there's been a lot more overlap, for example, between 
um, you know, who's fielding, you know, staffers for Republican administrations, um, even, you know, who's on the bench. But uh, I think there are definitely the, a lot of the major legal thinkers, if you're going back to the 80s or 90s, were people working for anti-abortion organizations. Um, so I think Clark Forsyth of Americans United for Life comes to mind. Um, he was definitely the architect of a lot of the sort of personhood-ish strategies that, not the true personhood amendment strategies, but strategies that would recognize personhood in other areas of the law. Um, Jim Bopp, the, uh, the guy behind, or the lawyer behind True the Vote and Citizens United has been the general counsel of the National Right to Life Committee since I don't remember, something like 1978, a long time. Um, there have been, uh, I think, on the political action committee side, uh, Marjorie Dannenfelser and other people at the Susan B. Anthony list. And then there are different architects if you look at the more sort of absolutist strategies. Um, Harold Cassidy and Alan Parker, who are both um, at work on trying to get abortion over rights undone. Um, th those are some of the ones who I think are kind of constant for decades, but the players in the story are changing now in part because it seems more likely that the court will overturn Roe soon. Thanks for that. So we have um, several questions that I, I want to summarize and it dovetails to what we talked about earlier, but our audience, many of us are active in faith-based um, abortion rights activism. And so there's been several questions about what do you believe is the best defense to the issues being raised? How can communities of faith be most effective to counter the anti-abortion movement? And one of the ways, uh, because I know you're a legal historian as well, is what strategies have worked for faith-based communities who support reproductive justice in the past? Well, I, I think um, there, there are a few things. I mean, one of the most obvious things is just visibility for pro-choice people of faith, because I'm sure those of you who've been following um, what's happened with Raphael Warnock, it, it, the idea that there are, there is such a thing as pro-choice people of faith will strike a lot of people who are not deeply involved in these debates as a contradiction in terms. And so groups like RCRC are very important in just getting that message out. Um, I think it's also important from an advocacy standpoint and has historically been important for pro-choice people of faith to talk in their own voice about these issues. And I think groups have been less effective when in coalitions, they're simply kind of repeating talking points that are effective talking points, but talking points that have been developed by, um, you know, reproductive rights advocacy groups or litigators, because then it just makes it seem as if the pro-choice faith community is pro-choice, but not necessarily particularly speaking from a place of faith. So I think some of the advocates who've been the most effective have been doing advocacy in a way that feels unique to people of faith or is coming from a place of faith, rather than just being a nominally religious voice in a broader uh, pro-choice coalition, which has often been what has happened in major debates about things um, like the Hyde Amendment. And then I think in terms of um, something else that I've seen pro-choice people of faith do effectively is, is sort of have conversations where they listen to people who are ambivalent or who are opposed to abortion, but who are respectful and interested in dialogue. I've seen that be done much more effectively by pro-choice people of faith than other pro-choice groups who may be coming from this at this from a very different, um, potentially more, at, polarized from the outset perspective um, and not be able to sort of meet people where they are and help people to understand why there is a pro-choice faith perspective or why it makes sense. Um, and I think that's, I think historians are good at that too, because we sort of have to, you know, it's not my job to tell you what to think, right? That's not Gil's job either. So I think sometimes if you study people, how they got where they are, or you talk to people from a place of faith about how they got where they are, you can find something more productive to talk about than if you're beginning from a position of, you know, seeking imminent political victory on some narrow issue. Thank you for that. Um, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to read one from uh, Joanne Tipple, and she writes, while not trained in the medical field, but as a clergy person who wants to support any woman who may have questions about pursuing an abortion, if that was the decision that was best for her, am I restricted in what I say? So I take the question to mean, um, do people of faith have restrictions placed upon them in abortion counseling and support? 
Well, um, it, it depends on your role legally. Most informed consent regulations, so usually the answer is no, right? Um, so if you, for the most part, most state laws deal with the responsibilities of people actually performing abortions. Um, if you're working in a clinic, it may be more complicated, but you would, as a pro-choice person of faith, that's where the argument that you have religious liberty to counsel as your faith deems fit, that would be where that would be the most powerful. And if you're not working in an actual medical setting where a state could sort of deem you a de facto healthcare provider, you would have no restrictions at all. And that's something else I think that's really important and something that's um, often lost in this is that a lot of anti-abortion activists are effective not because the laws are actually in effect or not because the laws could ever be in effect, but because people don't know what the laws are and that has a chilling effect. So in I live in Florida in the panhandle near both Alabama and Georgia, and I had, I've had i always had lots of people emailing me asking, is abortion, I, will I go to jail if I have an abortion in Alabama today? And the answer is no, but people don't know that. And I think that's something similar, I think, for pro-choice people of faith to keep up with is to know what legal rights you actually have. Um, and the more informed you are, often the fine, you'll find the more liberty you have to do what already feels right for you. Thank you so much, Professor Ziegler, for sharing your knowledge with us, for sharing your scholarship with us. I want to thank you all, those of you in the audience, for sharing your questions and inviting this robust conversation. I also want to invite you all to visit rcrc.org, to sign up for our newsletter, to sign up for our future seminars. We have so many great historians and scholars coming to share their knowledge with us this coming year on a range of topics. I am so excited for what we have in store for you all so that we can learn together to broaden our knowledge about the histories and politics of faith and choice. So thank you again. Please again visit rcrc.org and do check out Professor Ziegler's books and articles and scholarship. A little Google stalking will get you to all of these. I can't recommend them. I, I can say so many great things about them. I said it at the beginning, but her scholarship is path setting and I do encourage you to read it. Thank you again for participating today. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs>